Order, order. Sir Mike Fanning to move the motion, please. Chairman, it's a privilege uh, to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon, and we're in the coolest place in Westminster, so let's see if we can stay in here. This is probably the only room with any decent air conditioning. And I want to start by declaring an interest, um, as well as being a former uh, disabilities minister, I am also dyslexic, which wasn't diagnosed. I call it diagnosed for me until I was in the military when I was sent off on a course and then been told by an education officer that I was dyslexic and I thought it was some kind of tropical disease. No one ever said to me at school that when I had real struggled with English and maths, uh, particularly reading, that, that, that I may have a learning difficulty. Um, and I was told at school that I was thick by my headmaster, I'm not allowed to take my 11 plus. I would have failed my 11 plus. But no one with dyslexia is sick. They just struggle sometimes with understanding of words and in and mathematics. And also I declare an interest that I'm a non-exec director of a law firm, even though I'm not legally trained, unlike the minister. And I want to, at the outset, say that I would like this to be a debate, because I think it's not an us and them situation. I think for people with um, visual impairment and uh, or dyslexia or another learning difficulty that prevents them being able to read, read the written word as easily as some other people and most people in the country. This is an anomaly which is still out there which hopefully we can try and resolve. And I know there are discussions within government. I think there was in discussions in government when I was a disabilities minister uh, back under the, uh, the coalition um, ministry, but it, it looked at the time as if it was difficult. And there are campaign groups out there that have said to me, well, we should be able to take the government to court under the Act. Um, and of course, the, the government are exempt from the 2010 Act, that Parliament under Section 29 is exempt from that. But I think that as I go through my com commentary, there will be perhaps other areas of legislation where the government should take note that the legislation, like, as it is at the moment, weight may well be um, technically illegal. And I, I use the fact that I'm a layperson, not a legal beagle. According to um, audio books, according to the Publishers Association, um, in 2020 rose by 69%. That, I think, might have had a lot to do with COVID. It may well have had a lot to do with COVID. But the Prime Minister, then the Chancellor, back on the 11th of March 2020, said, and I quote, a world-class education will help the next generation thrive, and nothing can be done more fundamentally than that than reading. And yet digital publications are subject to VAT. That is not right. So today I'm abolishing the reading tax. Now, that was e-books, Mr Chairman. But I don't think anybody out there knows the difference between audiobooks and e-books. And actually, I don't think the government, I think it was a genuine mistake that when we have zero rate on books um, and publications of all types, whether it be academic, fiction, non-fiction, and then e-books was exempt, why a whole class of people, a whole group of people from many different backgrounds were then thrilled for a minute or two and then, once they saw the small print, realised that they weren't going to be still excluded. And for many, many of our constituents, audio is their only communication with the outside world about what's going on. If someone uses audiobooks to read fiction or non-fiction, but then perhaps they, like we all want to do, get on in life, and audiobooks is part of that process in training, in learning, in, you know, in education. Holding them back by having 20% on everything that they purchase. And when we talk about um, people with disabilities, they're already uh, being penalised extensively going forward. Anyway, I think Scope have used a figure of over, I think, over £900. That per £970 per month, worse off. And that's a figure I kind of recognise from when I was at the disability, which is why we do give other benefits out to people with disability. 
But in this particular area, if you're using audiobooks extensively, then that 20% is a huge amount of your income or your household income. And we're not just talking about people that are visually impaired, as I alluded to earlier on, and it's not just people that are dyslexic like myself. Um, my form of dyslexia is quite minimal. I tend to memorise everything I want to try and do. As you probably know, I don't tend to read from script. Um, I, I get much too wooden when I try it and do it, and it's much better if you kind of, in my case, memorise most of the bullet points that I wanted, wanted to, to raise. So the question is, I think, very simply to the Minister, and I, and I, and I know the Minister cares passionately about making quality fair, but the Equalities Act, as it is at the moment, it doesn't quite hit the nail. It doesn't do what it says on the tin. Does it protect all people from discrimination? In other words, does it protect people that need to use audiobooks from discrimination in that they have to pay 20% for their ability to read? Yeah. I'll just finish this point, this point, 20% on that point. Sorry, 20% on everything they want to read where the rest of the population that can read visual books don't have to pay that. I give way to you. Thank you. I thank the right honourable gentleman for giving way. Um, isn't it true also that um, young people uh, especially enjoy audiobooks and it's a real path for them into the joy of reading? And, it would other, it, and because of the expense, some of them aren't actually going to be able to, to discover the joy of reading because that's how the first want to approach reading at all. Well, not reading, but getting access to literature, so I put it that way. I, I, I agree with the Honourable Lady, but I think that's part of the problem which the Minister, as a Treasury Minister, will do. So it's quite difficult, when I was alluding to a moment ago, when we're talking about discrimination, how we can actually make sure that the people are being discriminated against have the ability to have audiobooks, rather than people that can read in general terms, and I'll come back onto that point in a second if I can, um, how, how you, you, you can protect the, the treasury from the cost burdens. And I think that's probably where the, I'll come back to this in a second, probably where the biggest problem is. It, if it was just about people who were visually impaired, that's a group of people which are quite, without being rude, easily identified to them and the Treasury can do those calculations quite quickly. If, once you start getting into the realms of what I was just talking about with other people with learning difficulties and, and dyslexia being one of them, um, and a huge percentage of those people have not had the diagnosis, how do you capture those people? And then, thirdly, the point that the Honourable Lady is making, how do you then expand that completely into areas where getting people that are not natural readers and I don't want to get into a class situation but I, mean, I, I didn't read very many books when I was at school because I had struggled to read and, and I know people that was in school with me which weren't dyslexic that just don't read it's not something and we want to people to expand their knowledge and education and view of the world as much as possible so if you, don't, if, if you can read, read you're not visually impaired but you want to use audio books Shouldn't that be okay? And I think the Treasury would turn around and say, well, how do you find the costs in relation to that? So if you go to the whole realm of removing, which I, I agree with the Honourable Lady on, but I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here. I, I agree that that's the only way we can do it. E-books were removed. We don't know who uses e-books at the end of the day, but they've been removed. All printed publication books are exempt, but audio aren't. And even though it would be easier, and I remember vividly some of the conversations when I was the Disabilities Minister, and it would be easier just to define this for a certain group of people, I don't think that would be fair. Um, and not least for the, the, the millions of people, I think, out there that are dyslexic that have never had a diagnosis from dyslexia. And, of course, dyslexia is a very large spectrum. The Equality Act, coming back to the point I was trying to make earlier, the Equality Act... Um, means that no one should be discriminated against because of um, the disability, the sex, the race. There's a whole long list of things. And I think 
even though Parliament can't be held under the, under the Act, if we're telling outside bodies that they are to discriminate, Parliament actually is actually being disingenuous, I suspect, in saying, well, we, won't, we can't be... We're not breaking the, the Equalities Act, but we're telling you to do so. The example of this is pretty obvious. The, the, a, a local authority that wants to sell e-books would have to charge VAT in, in a library, for instance, or something like that, whereas, obviously, there's no VAT, VAT in books. To the minister's department, the, depart, the parliament is telling an agency of government, i.e. Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, to charge VAT on audio books. So if, if they did that without an Act of Parliament, that would be discriminatory. But because we're under Section 29, we're exempt from that, we're not. Now, I'm pretty well known, long before the word of Brexit, Mr Chairman, of being what used to be called a Eurosceptic. So for me, I wanted to leave the European Union and I wanted this country to be a bit sovereignty into it. But if there are laws on our statute books, whether it be the European Court of Human Rights, we should use them. However, so let's quote the European Court of Human Rights. Section 6 in brackets, in brackets 1 of the Human... Sorry, not the, the uh, European Court, The Human Rights Act, our own Act of 1988, provides that unlawful... It is unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with a convention... Section 6, in brackets, 2. So there are other acts within Parliament that are on statute that, by charging VAT, argue, well, I'm sure there's plenty of lawyers that would argue one way and argue another, but morally and ethically, it cannot be right that we've got legislation on the statute books to say that we should not discriminate, the Human Rights Act, the Equalities Act, other European acts, and yet we are still in a situation that someone who wants to improve their life, in, for whatever reason, because of no choice of their own, they are penalised by our tax system. Now, as we, as we go forward, Mr Chairman, I'm sure the Minister will probably say to me, this is very complicated. And, that's what, and I know what a brief will say, because it's not dissimilar to the briefs that were given to me when I was sitting in, in that very chair. But because something is difficult, doesn't make it right that we don't do something about it. My, one of my constituents, whose sight is failing, I'm not in any way going to indicate who she is, is finding that her ability to work in commerce is being affected. And she relies now almost completely on an audio book version. Now there are there's software out there as we know now as, as, as well that will help people. But she relies almost completely now on audio books. She doesn't want anybody to know that. She works from home and she's, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put words into her mouth, but for her own reasons, she wants, because of her visual, visual impairment now, wants to use audio books. How can that be right? that if she needs it this week, she has to pay 20% on the product. Last week, when she didn't need to read, the, she could read a publication last month, last year, then she didn't have to pay 20%. Let's look at education for a second. This is where I deviate from everybody's notes that they've helped me try and write, and I will come back to some of the, the people that have been very supportive of me bringing this debate. Education books are quite rightly VAT free, like all printed books. Audio books are not. So in some of our special schools, and I know probably the minister will say that they, a lot of this VAT can be claimed back, but in individuals it can't. So if mum and dad or grandpa and grandma want to help their son, grandson, granddaughter, that's at a special needs school with an audio book, well, they can't claim that VAT back. Only organisations obviously can. But that child's being held back 
because of perhaps they don't have the money to buy the amount of books. So on every five books they would buy audio-wise, one of them's lost to VAT. And we need taxes, and we need taxes to pay for the schools I've just alluded to, we need it for the education system, health, all the other things we see. But for the public to have trust in our taxation system, it has to be fair, it has to be proportionate, and it has to be in the public's eye, because we're spending their money on their behalf, it has to be right and proper. And for too long, this is the guard. Now, I think the when the Prime Minister, then the, the Chancellor, made that comment, and I think it's worth just reading that last bit again, it cannot be right, so today I am abolishing the reading tax. Now, that referred specifically to books, printed, and e-books. Why on earth didn't it just say audiobooks? I really don't understand that. So, Mr Chairman, I think there's a couple of um, organisations, and I'll probably get the, not all of them out there in, in time before I get to read them, but I've, I've particularly been helped by, by Scope, by the RNIB. The House of Commons Library have been fantastically helpful because this is a... I didn't want the debate to be about us, you know, you nasty, horrible government, you're not doing this, this nasty, horrible government. It's not about that. Governments haven't done this since before this particular government came in, and they haven't done it before. There are things that get left when you're in government, and you think, I wish that I'd done that. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I'm leaving this house whenever the next election comes, and I don't want to leave this house with a few things still in my bucket list that I wish I'd done more about perhaps when I was the minister. I wish I'd have kicked harder when I was a disabilities minister, particularly against my treasury colleagues. So I'm going to kick now for these people that are suffering. There's 20% tax for no fault of their own, which surely morally, ethically has to be wrong. Thank you. The question is, that this House has considered the matter of VAT on audio books. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr Sharma, and it's a real pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and, as they say, follow that. That was a really passionate, informed debate by someone who really understands the difficulties that this uh, tax on audio books represents uh, to some people and the honourable member for Hemel Hempstead whom I should who I should congratulate on uh, uh, securing this debate might not be legally qualified as he said but he certainly knows what he's talking about um, I, I've followed his arguments very carefully and I love the idea of his bucket list <laughs> ticking off something on his bucket list and I think any kind of persuasion that can be used to get rid of this tax is well worth using. I, do, I also, and I think one of the reasons I enjoy doing Westminster Hall debates is they tend to be less contentious tend to be a meeting of minds and people who are interested coming together to try to solve a common problem. And that's something that not uh, too many of our constituents see too often. I, too, want to thank a number of organisations, especially uh, RNIB, and I was also involved um, in, in my time here in the Acts the Tax campaign, which led to the abolition of the tax on e-books and, and print, book, well, print books. Um, and it's, it is, I think it is a, 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 an aberration, just a, one of these in unintended consequences, uh, ideals, that there still is this tax on audiobooks. Now, I love audiobooks um, as well. I'm a voracious reader, I must say, of nothing particularly mind-blowingly interesting, but it's a great way to relax. But I know many other people, especially those with visual impairment and dyslexia and other conditions, actually get great joy out of just losing themselves in a good book for a few hours on an afternoon like today. There's nothing nicer. 
and for some younger people, and for even people studying when I was doing an open university course. Uh, this is a confession that I may have to ask Hansard not to record, but I know they will. I can't read Dickens. I have been read lots of considered fantastic authors and older authors, and I love Hardy, but I cannot read Dickens. And for a course I was doing, I was required to read a Dickens novel. And I thought, I can't. Oh, oh. And the aud an audio book was my answer. And I just, I love listening to someone reading Dickens to me, but I couldn't really. And so there are good sometimes educational benefits as well, because if people are struggling to read, if they can access the literature in a different form, then it may, as I've said earlier, pique their interest in reading. And we all know that everyone, especially young people, especially um, nowadays, really benefit from sitting down quietly and absorbing things uh, in a way that doesn't involve playing video games and uh, killing people, etc., online. Uh, Mr. Sharma, I think it's really important that people with visual impairment and dyslexia and other medical conditions that require them to read in a, difficult, a different way shouldn't be excluded. And I, 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 took, I listened very carefully to the Honourable Member uh, for Hemel Hempstead. Uh, and there, are, there would be real issues in trying to circumnavigate who uh, would be eligible for some kind of exemption. And that's why in this case, and in many other cases, but specifically this afternoon, in this case, I would plead with the Minister to make it a universal exemption. That is, you don't have to prove that you are, um, you cannot access books in any other way. The, the tax should be gone because it's, it's reading. It, it's not reading, but it's accessing literature, and that's important well, well, for everyone, certainly. I think that's important that I, I probably didn't uh, espouse very well in my... To ask someone to prove their disability um, may well exclude a whole tranche of people. That sort of vetting, I think, would be so negative for so many people, they just wouldn't actually do it. So I agree completely that, that that's why the general, general relaxation of VAT is, is the only way forward. Um, I totally agree with uh, the gentleman. He actually expressed it much better than I was able to. Um, Mr. Sharma, we also know that reading has many mental health benefits, um, and there is a clear link between reading and improved well-being. And given that the cost of living crisis has led to soaring rates of stress and anxiety and depression, there are going to be clear benefits to giving access uh, and making uh, audiobooks more affordable. In Norby, for example, and I frequently in other debates as well, um, refer to small independent nations, but Norway, and not for any other reason, but Norway has scrapped VAT on audiobooks altogether. I think it's really important. I mean, the National Literary Trust says that two in five uh, audiobook listeners are children and young people said that listening to an audiobook or pod podcast had got them interested in reading books. Something that encourages children to read has got to be good. Most children and young people who enjoy listening say they also enjoy reading, with compared with children who don't enjoy listening. So ensuring that children and young people are introduced to reading in a way they find engaging and enjoyable is a vital means of improving literacy. And, you know, I have grandchildren. I know they love listening to these stories on either BBC or through their fancy machine that I bought one of them for Christmas last year. You know, they love just listening and it actually encourages them to think about books in a positive way. And there are many children um, who would benefit even more if there was no tax on this. Reducing the VAT on audiobooks is really essential to make sure that young people especially listen to books. Um, I, I want to ask the Minister a question because the RNIB asked me to ask you, so I will. And um, they've asked, has there been an evaluation, have the, has the Minister evaluated the, the cost of extending the VAT exemption to those who are blind and partially sighted or have print disabilities? Has there been anything done on that? Now, that's a question from the RNIB, but I would like to further say 
what would the cost actually be of just removing the tax entirely? Mr Sharma, I don't think there is any necessity for me to go on further because the Honourable Member for Hemstead actually covered this topic in an extremely effective way. There is no, I cannot find an argument against. So I'm going to sit now, let the opposition front bench speak and listen very, very carefully to what the Minister has to say on this very important topic. Thank you. James Murray. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve um, under the uh, chairmanship of my parliamentary neighbour uh, in, in Ealing. Um, I'd like to start by um, very wholeheartedly congratulating the Honourable Member for Hemel Hempstead for securing this debate. Um, I found, I was listening with great interest to what he said, and I thought his speech was very um, thoughtful and heartfelt, um, and I found it very informative uh, myself uh, in understanding more about this issue, and indeed, in preparing for this debate today, um, I found it very informative uh, to understand the nuance um, of the issues in relation to audiobooks uh, in greater detail. Um, I mean, I'd like to also begin by thanking, as well as the Honourable Member, um, several organisations who I know have been involved in campaigning uh, for uh, this change, including the Macula Society, the Society of Authors and the Writers Guild of Great Britain, who are understandable, uh, called for VAT on audiobooks to be removed. Um, and Mr Chair, when I was reading uh, more about uh, this campaign before coming to this debate today, um, I, I noted that an early day motion has been tabled as part of this campaign. Um, and I found that, as I'm sure others uh, will have found it too, um, also informative in setting out the benefits um, of audiobooks uh, generally for many people with sight loss, uh, visual impairment, uh, dyslexia, or other reading um, disabilities. Because that motion uh, explains how audiobooks offer unique opportunities for visually impaired and dyslexic people to improve their education and on a par with their peers. It recognises the role of audiobooks in enabling visually impaired and dyslexic people to continue working independently for longer and thereby contribute to the economy for longer. Um, and it explains how audiobooks open up a world of information, literature and poetry to visually impaired and dyslexic people. So I think the attractions and benefits of audiobooks are clear but of course, there is a question about how much they cost. Um, indeed, the cost of audiobooks, whilst this debate focuses on uh, VAT in particular, um, obviously there is a wider context here um, about inflation, the high tax burden in our country and so on, which affect people's um, spending across the board. But the focus of this debate is specifically, of course, on VAT um, as it applies to audiobooks. And um, I also learnt in my uh, reading around this topic before this debate um, that the specific application of VAT to printed publications um, actually dates right back to the introduction of VAT uh, in 1973, at which point printed books, newspapers and magazines were given a zero rate. Now, of course, more recent uh, technological changes um, are raising questions over how the tax system um, across the board um, adjusts to a more uh, digital world. And this applies in many parts of our society um, and our economy, and it raises questions about fairness, um, consistency, and of course, uh, revenue raising. Um, now, I know that in response to technological changes, we know that since May the 1st, 2020, the zero rate of VAT charged on printed books, newspapers and magazines has also applied to e-publications. However, as we've heard from the honorable uh, gentleman today, the sale of audiobooks continues to be subject to the standard rate at 20%. Um, and so, Mr Chair, um, I will uh, listen to, with interest to the Minister's response because I think it is clear what the attractions and benefits of audiobooks are and I'm sure the Minister will recognise many of the points made today about the importance of audiobooks for people with uh, sight loss, visual impairment, dyslexia and other reading disabilities. Um, in the opposition, we, we do appreciate, however, that expanding the scope of VAT um, is a complex consideration that can add pressures to uh, the public finances. So. Um, I'm sure the government will carefully consider this issue, um, and I look forward, like other members here, to hearing the Minister's response. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Sharma. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Uh, and uh, first of all, may I start by congratulating my right honourable friend for securing this debate, but also to thank him very sincerely for the personal experiences he has brought into this debate. Uh, for what it's worth, Mr Sharma, I did not know that my right honourable friend 
uh, has lived with di d dyslexia. I have seen him so many times in the chamber, uh, both uh, at the dispatch box and, of course, as an eminent backbencher. And uh, he, his ability to memorise uh, the briefs that we get, I am genuinely in awe of because... Uh, uh, anyone who has uh, had to stand at the dispatch box, whether in government or in opposition, will know somehow how dense, uh, densely written uh, those uh, and complex those topics can be. I happily give way. The Minister and the civil servants that are listening to this will realise just how petrified they were when I walked into my first ministerial position and said, by the way, I memorise, I don't read your submissions. Uh, that you want me to read out of the dispatch box. And in the further seven departments, it, but they got round Westminster eventually, don't try to push stuff in front of him. But it is, it is interesting that you, we, we take for granted that people are reading verbatim what's in front of them. An awful lot of people with reading difficulties and learning difficulties don't. They actually go with what their gut feeling is, which is what I've always tended to do. No, he makes a very important point here, more generally. If, if, uh, if I may have uh, the chair's uh, munificence for a moment, if I just observe uh, that the, it is so important, I think, that people such as my right honourable friend show that dyslexia or other learning um, conditions, they need play no barrier in uh, a person's ability to achieve success nowadays. In many ways, my right honourable friend... Uh, will have been at the forefront of this change. I was horrified to hear uh, the, um, the reaction he had at school. I very much hope and trust nowadays children with a similar condition would not have that reaction. It would be much, much better understood. Uh, and, and, of course, and the, uh, as he, and, and the very fact he... Uh, rather endearingly described it, he thought it was a tropical disease. I mean, it shows just how far we have come, actually. And he and others have been at the forefront of that. And I, I genuinely am grateful to him for uh, sharing his experiences with us. Uh, in relation to um, the topic itself, uh, ensuring that everybody is able to access books in their forms uh, is something that this government takes very seriously. Driving up standards in literacy has been the government's long-term priority in education and our focus over the past decade has been on improving the teaching of reading for everybody. We've given students across the country a solid foundation in reading and this isn't just to give uh, young people the skills that are vital for their success in later life but also, uh, as the Honourable Lady for Motherwell and Wishaw put so eloquently, to encourage a lifelong love and respect for one of life's greatest pleasures. I mean, I, I very much understand uh, the enormous pleasures that audiobooks can bring. As, as someone whose constituency is quite some distance from London, as I know hers is, um, the ability to listen to an audiobook when you have a... Um, a, a, an excitable seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven-year-old, um, as, as he's been through my career in this place, uh, having an audio book that really grips a young child's uh, attention can be a, a godsend to uh, parents struggling on long journeys. But there is also the much more serious point. I, I'm, I'm veering into flippancy there, but the much more serious point about what it can mean for an individual's uh, ability to read and an ability to. Uh, enjoy reading and, and uh, my right honourable friend again gave a very very compelling example of his constituent who's who's losing her sight and with it she fears she is losing her ability to continue enjoying uh, reading and, and that is something um, that I take very seriously and I very much understand the point he makes about the difference difference in um, timing uh, and the implications of VAT on that. We very much believe that a love of reading should be ignited at a young age and that's why we have committed to ensuring that early reading is taught well in schools. We have packages of measures. Y yes, of course. On the point, the, the Minister's making a very good point, but supplementary to that, as in a previous life as a university lecturer in journalism, I had a student who was blind. Um, and those books which were available as audio books were much more expensive um, because of the VAT, there were fewer of them. Um, and now with podcasts, there is, there is more material. So the educational value 
it is not just in schools, it goes right mm -hmm. through to higher education. Um, and also I had personal experience of a, an elderly grandparent who went blind but was able to continue to read. But it then becomes a lifeline and the VAT is an obstacle to a vital lifeline for elderly people who can no longer read. Mm. Uh, very much, I do, I do genuinely accept the point about, uh, although this part of my speech is focusing on children, I very much accept the point that, of course, this is a love of reading throughout one's life. But if I may just focus for the moment on uh, children, because we, we, as part of this um, debate, we do want to bring forward, I hope, the very positive work that I hope is welcomed across the House. Uh, about trying to in improve and give that love of reading to young people in school. And the, we have uh, what's called the English Hubs programme uh, to promote a love of reading and spread best practice in teaching pupils to read, supporting schools in England to provide excellent phonics and early language teaching. I, I, know, I know the Honourable Lady will be able to help us on what, what happens in Scotland, but this ability to teach... Um, uh, reading and uh, particularly through this use of phonics uh, is very much uh, recognised uh, and what this means, this hub uh, programme means is that literary specialists provide tailored support to schools including running events to showcase excellent practice in teaching and reading and working with local schools to develop their practice and so far it has supported 1,600 schools intensively with a focus on supporting children who are making the slowest progress in reading, many of whom come from disadvantaged backgrounds. I give way. It's a key stage one. English yeah. does phonics, teaches it. It's all, the hubs are brilliant. Mm. Absolutely great. It doesn't help dyslexic kids and it doesn't help kids who are visually impaired. Because it's a reading, it's a book reading hub, not actually what they do need. Uh, nothing of what I've said today is to get away from the fact that we want more and more people to have this, a wonderful experience of reading. But for those that can't, they're being excluded from those hubs that the minister is just referring to. Understand. Obviously, it, it's not my area of expertise in that I'm here today responding on VAT, but I will very much take away his observations as to those hubs. I mean, uh, I know there, schools uh, find their own ways as well of teaching their children. Um, and I remember Phonics is great. Very, very recently, I, I had the great pleasure of uh, a Friday afternoon visit to a wonderful primary school in my constituency, uh, Mayor Lafen, where they have, uh, they call it mystery reading, where somebody has to come in and read a book or an extract from a book to um, the entire primary school to try to encourage them to finish that book. And uh, the programs like that, I know schools do this across uh, the country to encourage reading and to make it a, a, a real pleasure for younger people, for, uh, for children. And so I very much support any efforts that uh, try to bring that about. Um, we have also provided £8.7 million pounds of funding this academic year to support schools in purchasing uh, complete systematic synthetic phonics programs in their curriculums. I think we, that is a good example of DFE jargon there. Um, but uh, by ensuring high quality phonics teaching and improving literacy levels, uh, we are giving children a solid base on which to prepare as they build, uh, to build on which to build as they progress through school. Uh, finally, we have published also the f reading framework uh, since uh, 2021. Over 90% of schools have read the framework, which provides guidance to schools on how to improve the teaching of reading. Uh, it uh, focuses on the early stages of teaching reading and the contribution of talks, stories and systematic synthetic phonics, as well as helping schools to meet existing expectations for teaching early learnings. Uh, we very much um, appreciate the fact that these measures are paying off. Uh, England came fourth out of the 43 countries that tested children of the same age for primary reading proficiency in the International Reading Literacy Study, uh, and these results were published in May this year. This is a real success, uh, and we very much um, know that it is down to the... Uh, concentration on phonics uh, and is driven by improvements for those pupils who have perhaps struggled 
uh, in the past. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful, as I know my right honourable friend is, to the efforts of uh, uh, ministerial colleagues who have driven those changes through over the years. But we do also recognise the importance of provision for children with special educational needs and disabilities, including uh, children uh, who live with some of the conditions we've heard about today, including uh, sight, uh, partial, partial sightedness and blindness and uh, with dyslexia and other learning um, conditions. And we know that these cohorts may require extra support. And so the next reading framework to be published will include guidance on supporting children who are struggling to read, including those with special educational needs. Uh, and uh, the government speaks regularly to experts, uh, including SEND specialists, specialist schools, and English hubs about the way in which the government can support teachers to ensure that children with dyslexia and other learning difficulties can progress well in their reading and meet the expectations by the time they leave primary school. Uh, I'll now turn, if I may, to the subject of VAT. Uh, and, uh, of course, as uh, colleagues across the House knows, VAT is a broad-based tax on consumption, and the 20% standard rate applies to most goods and services. Whilst there are exceptions to the standard rate, these have always been strictly limited by both legal and fiscal considerations. We did indeed cut the VAT on certain digital publications in uh, March budget 2020, uh, to support literacy and reading in all its forms and to make it clear that e-books, e-newspapers, e-magazines and academic e-journals are entitled to the same VAT treatment as their physical counterparts. The extension of uh, the zero rate of VAT to e-publications was introduced to address that inconsistency of approach between certain physical uh, publications and their digital counterparts. So there is a mirroring between the two. If a, if a publication has a zero rate uh, in uh, physical form, then now in uh, digital form it has the similar exemption. There will be categories of publications where because the physical form does not have zero rate, uh, zero rating, the digital form does not either. Uh, and uh, I, I just say that because in relation to audio books, uh, and indeed the Honourable Lady um, uh, for Edinburgh uh, mentioned podcasts, that, wouldn't that, that would not fall into that approach if, if one were to extend it to um, uh, audio uh, publications. Um, the, there is, we say, no such inconsistency in relation to audio books, but I appreciate that is the point of discussion under topic today. Uh, any uh, VAT relief, as colleagues know, would come at a cost to the Exchequer, uh, and uh, it would be very difficult to target. Um, the, indeed, the Honourable Lady asked me, has, uh, have we, the RNB, uh, RNIB has asked, has this been uh, costed, uh, both for people living with sight conditions and more generally uh, the general public um, uh, and my answer to her is there, are, there is work ongoing. Um, I do not have figures I can give her today because I need to satisfy myself that they are accurate and so on but what I w do want to do because I take the point is to write to her in due course when, I have the, when I'm in a, play, in a position to do so because I think that's a very um, fair question. One of the things that um, we're mindful of as well, as the Honourable Gentleman for the Opposition noted, you know, the, the speed of change in technology means that we have to, we will, there is a sense at the moment that the law has to try to keep pace with that and it can be difficult. I think we all acknowledge that. We know, for example, that many audiobooks are now provided on subscription along with other forms of media such as podcasts. Uh, and so trying to introduce distinctions between these different type of products would introduce additional complexity into the VAT system. There is also uh, no guarantee that the benefit of any VAT relief would be passed through to the consumer in the form of lower prices. And this is quite an important point because um, we, I, I'm told there's been, you know, we, we've looked at whether... Um, the VAT exemption that was granted or announced in March 2020, we all assume that businesses will pass that on to consumers. But it seems that uh, that is not necessarily the case. And there may be, uh, it's not for me to advise either right honourable colleagues or um, charities, but it may be that that uh, it, 
is it itself a question that should be posed of those uh, publishers of e-books and so on as to why, if that, if that is the case, why that, that price cut is not being passed on to consumers. In addition, audiobooks are enjoyed by a wide range of consumers uh, and the majority of any relief would uh, primarily be felt by those who are not living with disabilities, preventing them from accessing physical and digital books. We also, in any debate on VAT, I'm, I'm obliged just to mention that um, it is the third l largest tax in the UK in terms of the yield uh, for um, the government and the state to provide public services. It is forecast to raise £161 billion this financial year alone. There are many, many public services um, of course, that are supported from those funds. And so we do have to look very carefully at every um, request uh, such as this to uh, change, tweak, um, try to fit the VAT system to meet the laudable aims and concerns of, of uh, colleagues across the House. And so, um, Mr Sharma, uh, I'm just uh, checking that I've um, answered every question and there was um, there was just a question actually about um, as I say about the VAT cut we uh, some might say well hang on a minute if you've imposed the VAT cut why can't you force businesses to um, impose those uh, that cut through we are you know we set the tax framework um, and but businesses must operate within that tax framework uh, but if a business chooses to absorb that uh, tax relief as profit rather than pass them on to consumers then that is a commercial decision that the business is taking. And as I say, that may be something that uh, others outside this chamber uh, may wish to reflect upon and, and uh, uh, reflect upon uh, in terms of dealing with this issue as a whole. And so in conclusion, uh, Mr Sharma, we um, very much understand the reason that my right honourable friend has uh, called this debate. We very much agree that literacy is a vitally important issue, not just for the youngest uh, citizens in our country but uh, stretching throughout our lifetimes uh, and we are confident that our record over the last 13 years show, shows that we are making the right decisions for children in schools. We believe that the measures we are continuing to take to support reading are the best way to target our resources uh, to deliver this wonderful benefit to everyone, but we do not rest on our laurels, which is precisely why, as I mentioned earlier, the reading framework guidance is going to um, focus on the needs of children living with uh, a special educational needs as well. And I very much uh, want to thank my rightable friend uh, for his um, debate uh, and to contributions around the House for this. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to uh, announce or give quite the news that he was hoping for uh, into today's debate, but I very much look forward to discussing this with him in the future. So, Mike Fanning, you won't. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Chair, and thank the Minister for the restricted comments that I fully understand that she's not going to commit to. Just to give her a little bit of help, the Publishers Association estimates it's £22 million a year. That would be into the exchequer. They may be wrong, and I accept the fact that not everybody will pass on. At this stage, I, sh <coughs> I should have done this earlier on, can I thank the House Commons Library, the Publishers Association, the National Literary Trust, Macula Society, NRNIB, Scope, Lycoma UK, Site Scotland and Site Scotland Veterans, um, my former colleagues in the military, Listing Books, Ability Net, Disability Rights UK and ALCS. And just to make one tiny point, uh, 57 colleagues, I think, signed my EDM. I look forward to further conversations with the Minister, uh, but we'll be back. And, and the Business Committee was very generous to give me 90 minutes here with that sort of numbers uh, supporting me at the Backbench Business Committee. I might be on the floor of the House with the Minister, perhaps in the autumn, when she might have some nicer comments and more helpful comments to me. Thank you. That this House has considered the matter of VAT 